I'm just recording. I'm going to put it on I'm, Facebook. I'm hoping that, like, yeah. yeah, activate your moral compass. I don't have a <laughs> compass. I don't have, yeah, I'm not sure there is a compass. And it's not pointing toward magnetic north. It's pointing towards magnetic south. This is the, if there is such a thing. Now, this is, let me just explain what's going on here to anybody who might be listening. I'm not well, but I'm doing a show about being well. <laughs> <laughs> so that's therefore, how you get well. That's how you. That's what I explained to somebody yeah, the other so day. Why do we keep teaching our kids how to be well? We should get them to teach other people, right? Oh, because yeah. isn't the best learning teaching? What's the saying? You yes. know, not that it's sayings, but it's no, something like that. But it is. It's you teach a man to fish, and he becomes well. Uh, no, that's, that's not the, right. That's the wrong saying. You feed him, and he becomes well. No, there is the. If you're a great teacher. You learn from your students, but they, but these are the worst sayings ever. <laughs> we don't know what the saying is, but we know what the theme of it is. This is why you can only get this kind of work, this kind of stuff at Dear Anxiety. You can't get it anywhere else. You can't get it out of Dear Love or Dear Hope. Those aren't shows that you should be listening to. You're listening to Dear Anxiety. And this is the show about mental health. It, it doesn't like, sound like it. Yeah, it's irreverent self-help. That's what it is. Irreverent self-help. We're not precious about it. We care, but we have our own issues. Let's not kid ourselves. In fact, let's kid ourselves. No, I'm doing that the rest of the time when I'm not doing the show. Now, let me tell you about Dear Anxiety. This is the show, one of the few shows that deals with mental health. It deals with how we relate to our thoughts and feelings and it's a show that teaches practice, skills that you can actually practice. All of our topics relate to mental health issues, relate to emotional fitness, relate to wellness, resilience, and this is where it all happens. And today, boy, this is a wonderful topic today. You're gonna love this, social anxiety. Oh, I'm boy. nervous, yeah, I'm nervous just saying it. Social anxiety, and it affects so many people, but before we dive into social anxiety, my partner, Social anxiety. She knows all about it. She's experienced it. That's why she's good at teaching resilience skills. She hails from the great state of denial. No, she does not. She hails from the University of Pennsylvania, where she studied applied positive psychology with the father of applied positive psychology, Dr. Martin Seligman. She has a wonderful company called Gozen, which teaches resilience skills to kids, parents, schools all over the world through animation and creative play. Her name is Rini Jane. She's listening to me as I speak. I am listening to you as you speak. Mm -hmm. And here I am. Thank you, Ed. I'm so excited to be here. I want to dive right into the myths about social anxiety because I feel like there are many. Yes. Can and I, that? yes, let's dive right in. I also want to say to Lee, who is our fine producer, that it's wonderful that music during uh, myth busting. <laughs> Thank you for the music, Lee. Thank you. We, lo we love Lee. Greatest. So here is, here's the thing about social anxiety. I feel like if you haven't experienced social anxiety, if you're looking at it from the outside, it feels like one of those things that happens when you are in a social situation and you're anxious, right? Doesn't that feel like that's when it happens? Right. But here's the myth. It does happen, obviously, during a social situation that's making you feel anxious, but it also happens before the social situation, right? You want to go to a party, but you're thinking, what if I say something stupid? What if I'm not wearing the right thing? What if I can't figure out who to talk to or where to stand? Or what if they start dancing and I don't want to do that, right? So there's a before period. And then let's say that you actually go to the party. Well, then there's anxiety after. You're at that gathering and you're thinking, oh my goodness, did, did anyone hear what I said? Or were they looking at me and what I did and how I acted? And so there is a before during and after when it comes to social anxiety. And now you can see it can really consume your life. Yeah, that's uh, those are really good good points. And, and to that end, it's always a good thing to ask yourself. It's always a good thing for me to ask myself, what is going on right now? Like monitor, to monitor my feelings and to say like before I'm going to something, oh, I'm setting myself up for a very high pressure situation right here because of what I'm thinking. And I just see that I'm thinking those things. I see that I'm thinking the worst is going to happen. Well, no wonder I feel like 
the way I feel. No wonder I don't feel well. Could I do this differently? Or could I just acknowledge that this is what's going on with me right now? So social, and I I'm love not- what Ed's doing right now. I love what you're doing right now. You're like a one man show. Yeah. Which, by the way, is the ultimate therapy. Okay, so teach us how to do that one man show. How do you I've do a one man show? I've like done that? it. I've done it. <clears throat> I've done it for years. I did it. You know, I've got all kinds of stories about that and social anxiety. I've looked at life from no sides now. That's why I'm able to do this. The song Both Sides Now. <laughs> I've looked at it from no sides now. And now I, I can. So anyway, before, during, and after, I'm familiar with anticipatory anxiety. You set yourself up believing that the worst will happen. You actually talk yourself into a state of social anxiety. And humans are so amazing. Arguably the only species that can think about something in the future and activate the anxiety response within our bodies in the present, right? You can just be thinking, your child can just be thinking, what if, what if this happens at the party? What if this happens at school? What if this happens at the lunch table? What if this happens at the bus? And all of a sudden their heart's racing, right? The fight or flight response has activated. They're sweating, they're dizzy, their face is red, and they could just be lying in bed thinking about this. It's unbelievable. And but it, we were talking <clears throat> myths, right? Yeah, myths. Yes, we were talking myths. So I know that a lot of parents, you know, are confused. And a lot of people are just confused generally about the differences between is it social anxiety? Is it shyness? Is it introversion? Right? I, I think with all anxiety, I like to use just a very simple way to figure out if your child is feeling anxious, which is, is it disrupting their life? Is it disrupting their life in a way they don't want it to be disrupted? Because when you're an introvert, for example, I don't know if you know this, Ed, but I'm an introvert. That's surprising to me. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. I enjoy really kind of calm, sort of minimally stimulating environments for the most part. I really recharge by being on my own and kind of like going into my own world. And that's something that I enjoy and that I'm okay with. I know who I am and I don't want it to be different. So that's introversion. You don't really want it to be different. When your child is socially anxious, that's different. They're wanting to be in the mix. They want to take part and to participate, but there is something stopping them, which is the anxiety. And it's almost like you're not enough sort of on steroids, right? The thoughts that you're not enough. Have you ever had those thoughts, Ed? Uh, no, never. Yes, I never. have I have them every <laughs> second of the day, just about. Uh, and, and I have to deal with that. I have, to, I have to relate to that and answer that. But yes, of course, I have those thoughts. And the issue is, let's actually look at those thoughts. Let's deal with those thoughts. And we're going to give you some skills that you can use. But I think what you said is really important, Rini, which is, if you're a parent and you're noticing that your kid, it's really getting in the way of them living their lives, that's a social, that's social anxiety. That is something that, you know, if they're not going to the birthday party and they're not leaving the room and they're not, you know, they're not able to, to participate in life in important situations, that, that's a very serious issue. Yes. Introversion is how you came into the world. You came into the world that way. Social anxiety is getting in the way of your world. It's getting in the way. It's often while there might be some genetic component to it, it basically is learned behavior. And then the ultimate thing that fuels the social anxiety is avoidance. It is reinforced by avoidance. And it's a really hard thing as a parent to see your child incredibly uncomfortable you know, it's it's one thing when they're hanging onto your leg when they're little and they're taking a little bit of time to warm up and they eventually jump in. But it's another thing when they're extremely uncomfortable to the point where they want to avoid everything, right? They want to avoid everything. And then you as a parent might feel kind of depleted by it. Maybe you feel like you've tried lots of things and they've backfired. So you stop dealing with it. So then you just kind of give in to the avoidance. Mom, I don't feel like going to that thing. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about, Ed? You Absolutely. give in to the avoidance. You give in to the avoidance. And then you learn what you're learning how to do is you're learning a habit. And once avoidance becomes a habit, what happens is you stop feeling your feelings and you stop thinking your thoughts. And you believe that feelings and thoughts can kill you. So you don't want to have them. I'm telling you this, Rainey, because this is what I went through as a kid. And, Tell me what you went through as a kid. Well, I was very afraid of school. 
and I did not want to go to school. I opened the doors to the school, big iron doors with like the Jacob Marley face uh, on there from Christmas Carol. And I opened the, the doors and I heard kids screaming and talking and loudness. And my first day of school, I had my bow tie on. I had my, my crew cut haircut. I had a red oh sport jacket. Oh, my goodness. I was cute. ready. Yeah, we, you had a bow tie on. I did. I did. <laughs> I love it. That's what people did in those days uh, many years ago. So I, I went there and I felt this tremendous fear. And I thought there was something wrong with me. See, I didn't know that fear was an emotion. I thought it was, there's something wrong with me. And what did I do? I turned around. I closed the doors. I walked back to my house at age four and a half or five. And I went up the stairs and I went into the apartment that we lived in and I went into bed. And mm -hmm. I, stayed in, I stayed there and I didn't go to school that day. And I'm not saying that that day set the tone for everything. But multiple days like that, they called me a school phobic later in later years. And so, so what I'm saying is I learned at a very early age that I couldn't tolerate my feelings. I learned that there was, I felt there was something wrong and no one ever sat me down and said, oh, you're just having, you're having a feeling. You're not your feelings. You're more That's than your That's amazing. Feeling. If someone That's had said amazing. that, well, I wouldn't be, you know, I would be, uh, I don't know what I would be, but here I am. And I'm not saying it like it's a negative thing. I'm saying here I, here I am. I can speak to this. It is just amazing that we begin to fear what we feel instinctively within our bodies. So you were getting a message when you were that four or five-year-old opening those doors, and the message was being sent by fear. Yes. Hey, there's something new going on here. Yes. It's making you uncomfortable, you know, and I'm trying to send you some information and maybe I'm even going to send you some information for self-preservation, or maybe I'm just activating at the wrong time. But just like you're saying, the fact that we're terrible at feeling our feelings, we're taught from a very young age to hide them, suppress them, quash them, avoid them, deny them, and then we miss all the messages. And then eventually, like you said, we have a lot of parents that write into us telling us that, you know, my, my child is refusing to go to school. And it might be a variety of reasons, but sometimes it is social anxiety and how incredibly difficult when your child doesn't want to go to school, right? Something you imagine, oh, they're going to go to school and they're going to learn and they're going to make friends and it's going to be this thing and I'm going to get a little break, <laughs> right? Yeah. Or I'm, I'm going to work, you know, during that time. You have all of these expectations that they're going to be learning and it's going to be so wonderful. And then your child comes home and they're like, uh, yeah, not doing that. Nope. Not doing it. Not going. Like, I can't believe you walked yourself home. No one knew. Oh, yeah. And then you went into bed. Yeah. And you went to hide. Yeah. 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 And it became, you know, it, it started a habit. There was a, a pattern. But I think, I think what's under the habit is because kids live in a world of good and bad. What happens when, with your thinking, and we've talked about this a lot on the show, is you don't have accurate thinking. And so your thinking is either I'm good or I'm bad. I'm bad. And so from a very early age, I got this belief. And the belief is anytime I have a feeling that I don't like or that I can't figure out, I'm bad. So now I'm bad for having feelings. And so this goes on very early and it's very hard to, life becomes very difficult for a person who thinks they're bad because they have feelings. Wow. Oh, it's, you know, I'm thinking of kids with social anxiety and this fear of judgment right, an evaluation by others and feeling inadequate and self-conscious and embarrassed and humiliated and feeling like they're not enough, feeling like they're not enough and everyone is judging them for this not enoughness. And then seeing that in your child communicated in many different ways through their behavior, maybe they're able to articulate it, but just seeing the outcome of that for a lot of kids is isolation. Right? And just being on their own and having to struggle through that. And I'm just, I guess I'm feeling for parents who are experiencing this with their children or who have experienced it themselves and are experiencing it with their children, that it's a really hard thing to go through. Um, so we feel you, Ed and I feel you. And Absolutely. as Ed said, he's been through it himself. Yeah. But I also want you to know that this is one of those things that you can work through. There are some things that are really hard to work through. This social anxiety is one of those things that you can work through, you can work through with your kids. 
Yeah, that's that's a fantastic thing to to realize. And of course, it is working on yourself while you're working on your kids. I'm going to guess that the chances are that you have somewhere as a parent in your background experienced these kinds of things, you know, and that you you can certainly you need self-care and your kids need self-care. But you need you need both components of it. It's very difficult as a parent to say, I'm going to go numb now. And now I'm going to take care of my child. And that is what I find a lot of parents doing because they're very busy and and they have to be on the move and they have to figure things out and they have a lot of stresses. But it's so important. You know, you say put your oxygen mask on, but maybe we can talk about some skills that you can use if your child suffers from social anxiety or you do. Yeah, I think it's so important for people to really look at this social anxiety in the face and know that, first of all, it's not all bad. I know it feels all bad and it seems all bad. But, you know, there's been some very interesting research on people with social anxiety. And you know what they find? They are deeply empathetic people, deeply emotionally empathetic. And they are closely attuned really to the feelings of other people. And what a wonderful quality to have that kind of sensitivity, right? Mm, mm. So it's not all bad. There are superpowers within, you know, what we're calling kids who experience social anxiety. So I think always start from a place of strength. We also know that kids with social anxiety, they have values that are related to giving, to being supportive, to being kind. So again, like wonderful, wonderful qualities. So start with your strengths. Know your strengths. We've said many times on the show that we would love for you to go out and take a strength survey and do that with your child. One we recommend is the VIA survey. So V as in Victor, I as in India, A as in Apple, viacharacter.org. We're in no way affiliated with them. We just think that they're awesome and that they have good surveys for kids. So Get your kids to take that survey and really know their strengths, okay, where they're starting from. And then they're really, I mean, this is for everything, Ed. There needs to be some radical acceptance of where we are at. For some reason, we have come to this place in society where there is a lot of showiness in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. We are showing the outcome of where we want to be on social media, We're Mm. seeing highlight reels, essentially. And we are getting to this place where our kids and ourselves, we want to show up perfect. And there's not an acceptance of where we're at and an ability to communicate like, yes, I am here. I think that this is why Ed and I both talk about some of the challenges that we have in our own life. And we definitely have them. (laughs) Absolutely. Often as our prep to this show, we're talking about our own challenges that we're going through. But I think that this is important because it's important to say, yes, this is who I am. I'm a work in progress. And for your child to say, yes, this is where I am. And I radically accept where I am and that I have work to do on myself. Know your strengths, accept where you are before doing anything else, before the action part. Know your strengths, accept where you are. I mean, just those just those kind of things. And you call it radical acceptance is a term that I'm very familiar with in some work with my daughter. They talk a lot about that, radical acceptance. And it's very different when you, you know, when I accept where I am and I stop resisting. So much pain comes from resistance and uh, denial and ignoring what's coming up, you know, ignoring where you're at. It could be so simple to just say, let me just check in with myself. Where am I at right now? What's going on with me right now? I don't have to do anything about it at the moment. Just what is going on right now? What am I thinking? What am I feeling? Where am I at? So it's a good question to ask yourself. Um, Absolutely. I love those check-ins that you talk about. They can be so powerful, even if you only do them once. You know, only do them once in a day. Yeah. Check in with yourself and teach your kids to check in with themselves. So, you know, we're talking about knowing your strengths, accepting where you are, radically accepting where you are and doing that as the parent as well and showing your kids you're doing that, that you're embodying these ideas. And then just knowing that 
there is change to be made, that change can happen. I think just the awareness that change is possible can be life-changing for kids because a lot of times there is this fixed mindset about the way that we are. Well, I'm just shy. I've been told that for my entire life. It's just the way I am and I will always be. Hmm. Shyness is a feeling like worry is a feeling. It is an experience that is finite, right? And it doesn't happen in every situation. So kids need to know that they have the ability to take action and to make change. That is, it's a fundamental and that there is hope to make change always. And then they can take little steps. The, you know, the thing about social anxiety and many anxieties when you're avoiding, avoiding keeps you in a vicious cycle of being anxious. And once you start facing the fear and being able to take a little bit of the discomfort that comes along with that, then you can really break the cycle of anxiety. <laughs> that's like the whole show. Uh, we're never doing a podcast again because that's everything. That's everything like all in a nutshell. Pretty much. Face your fear, feel the discomfort, overcome your fear, right? So I don't think it's actually the mechanical steps of doing it because I think anyone can learn to do it. It is really a belief system that you are able to do it. Yeah. And what when and you are able you are able to do it also. It's something that we say, and I've heard you say a lot, is these things are they may feel uncomfortable, but they're not dangerous. They may feel uncomfortable, but they're not dangerous. The other thing is they're not permanent. When you have intense feelings, oftentimes you feel like they're never going to end. You feel like it's permanent and you feel like it's dangerous and they're not. They're uncomfortable. So we need to like really change our definition of, you know, life is not about avoiding discomfort. It's actually accepting discomfort. Absolutely. So I think the ideal outcome of what you were describing that happened to you when you were a kid and you opened up those doors to school and you felt that discomfort, that is really the turning point. That is the point in time when all the difference is made because you either turn away and you run away from it or you turn toward it and you say, okay, you know, I'm having that queasy feeling in my stomach or, you know, my face is flush red and it's uncomfortable but it's not dangerous. And for many, many age kids and even grown-ups, personifying the worry is extremely important, right? Because this that's anxiety. And it, anxiety is a character. <laughs> right. How, any way you look at it, it's a character, right. Right? right? And it's a really interesting character. It's a character that's trying to push you around. It's a character that is notoriously inaccurate. So make it a character. Ed, you're amazing at making characters. Well, I what would the of voice of worry be? What does your voice of worry yeah, sound like? I don't know. Maybe you should go over here. Maybe you should go over there. Maybe you should do this. You're not enough. You're not enough. You're not enough. Yes, you're not enough. That's how it is with you every time. Oh, sure. Nothing ever works out. It never does because you're not enough. You're not enough and you're not enough. And by the way, if I didn't mention it already, you're not enough. What Ed just did, while hilarious and I love is an incredible intervention for your child. Have them create a voice that personifies this worry. It really externalizes the worry. It separates it from themselves. And then have them work on talking back to it or just making the voice. Because I'll tell you what that does. When you create that voice, first of all, it's silly. It can make you laugh. But it also gives you an action to take where you're creating the voice of the worry and you hear it so much that you can start to ignore it. It's like, oh yeah, there he is again. It becomes almost mundane, boring. Right. Oh yeah, I hear you worry. Like you're not, you're not bossing me around this time. I see what you're doing to my body, but it's just not going to happen this time. I'm walking through those doors, even though you're making me uncomfortable. You are literally talking back to that worry. Talk back to your worry. Yeah, talk, see it, make it a character. It's not you, it's separate from you. And uh, it's not who you are. And, and parents, you can, you can certainly have your own character. You can certainly make your own voice. Or you can certainly engage and just interview the worry. Just uh, draw it out. Ask, ask your kid, you know, questions like, where do you come from? What do, what do you eat? What's the, you know, play with it. Again, if I had had somebody or if I had known that I could practice this stuff before I went to school or when I came home from school, I might be, I might be a doctor by now. <laughs> 
<laughs> you might be what by now? I might be a doctor. Like, I probably would be. I you probably might be a doctor, doctor right now. Yeah, I'd be a very famous <laughs> surgeon. Dr. Jekyll, probably. I, Dr. Jekyll. I would be. My last name would be Jekyll. In fact, you'd say that, but last week we did a show and my, my worry voice was so scary that we had to redo the show. So that was really scary last week. So, you know, you don't know what you're going to get, but it's okay. But it's okay. Yeah. But it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> so now, so now we're going to get into, you know, we role play on the show. We talk about skills. We've talked about knowing. We've talked about knowing your strengths, accepting where you are, making it a character, interviewing your kid as the character or having your kid become a character or draw a character, whatever thing that they like the best or feel the most fun with. And then there are some other things that you can do, which we're actually going to role play. We're going to role play a situation. Let's get ready to role play. That is really common. That happens. That Let's say, for example, that I am afraid of going to parties and I'm going to say to Rini as my parent now, I don't want to go to this party because nobody's going to talk to me. And if nobody talks to me, I just end up standing there by myself. I don't have any friends. I don't have any friends at the school. I don't like going to the school. I don't like these parties and I don't want to go. Eddie, I told you, you can't be shy when you go to those things, okay? You're just being so shy. You need to just put your hand out. You have a lot to offer. I can't. You're, we're, you're amazing. You're so talkative at home. You always Why are you this. like this? You tell me this every time and every time I go and nobody talks to me and I'm sick of it. I'm just sick, sick, sick of it. Listen, I'm going to tell you the steps. You go up to someone, you make eye contact, okay? You put your hand out, you say, you shake their hand or you say hi and you ask them questions about themselves. Everyone likes to talk about themselves. They're into stuff that I'm not into and I don't want to be there. How many So then just listen, just listen. I'm not going. But the thing is, no, honey, you are going, okay? And when you, look, when you stand in the corner and you don't say anything, everybody thinks you're shy, but I know that's not really you. Well, that didn't work. Okay, so what's happening here? So this is a typical situation, right? You're trying to get your kid out the door. You're trying to inspire them. But what's really happening? What's happening here is that my parent is not listening to me. They're not acknowledging what's going on with me. So because they want me to be well and they want me to be happy and they love me. Because it's making them very uncomfortable that you're not able to go and do these things. And they want you, they love you, and they want you to be loved and they want everybody to see you as you see them. And, you know, sometimes it's a matter of having like kind of a... a mismatch at home as well. For example, I'm an introvert. I always have been, but I'm also kind of an ambivert. I'm able to be a chameleon in different situations, but my parents are total extroverts, right? So if you have the situation where your parents are extroverts and you are either an introvert or you're socially anxious, right? Because they're different and then they don't get it. My parents never used to get it. What do you mean you want to stay in? Like you're, you're a teen, what does that mean? <laughs> Why would you want to do that? Or they're just extremely uncomfortable because they don't want to see you suffer. Yes. Now, when you are uncomfortable as a parent, there there's something that I wish I could say to myself more often. I do sometimes, but even more often. And that is two words, slow down. Why do I say slow down? I say slow down because your mind is going to start racing. And you're, and you're going to fill in the space, right? Yes. And you're going to start chasing them. You're going to start having this feeling like, I just want to get over the feeling. I want to get over what they're experiencing so we can get to a better place. You can't get over it. It's not something you get over. It's something that you sit with. And then you can move through it. But there's nowhere to chase. There's nowhere to go. But if you feel yourself speeding up and talking like I'm talking right now and trying to talk to your kid, it's too fast. Take a breath. Slow down. Whatever. I love that advice. You don't have to have all the answers immediately. Sometimes you can say to your kids, I'm just thinking about it. I'm thinking about the best way that I can help you. And But I'm listening. You know, I'm here to listen. I'm listening and it helps me acknowledge, hey, you're telling me something. You don't want to go to the party. You're feeling worried. You're feeling afraid. You you have a picture in your mind of what's going to happen. That's really scary. It's scary to tell yourself those things. You are telling yourself those things, but it is scary. No question. Did you about. just do your own role play? Kind of. <laughs> kind of. 
kind of. Yeah, because I'm because I'm experiencing these feelings in the moment too. No, but it it is it is. So so let's do a scenario now. Wherein, okay, so that was the scenario that we all experience most of the time. Let's do a scenario where we actually use some tools. Right. So in this scenario where we use some tools, we know that we have already introduced to our child the idea that they can personify their worry. And we're going to ask them what worry is telling them because we really want them to speak in that voice and embody what the worry is so that they can kind of talk back to it. So again, this is with the preface, right, or the premise that we have already introduced the idea to them. Let's try that again. Round two. I don't want to go. I'm, 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 there's no way I'm going to go to this party. I'm never going to go. Nobody ever hey, talks Eddie. to me. I hate it. Oh, God, I hate these parties. Oh, no. I feel that you've, you're getting worried about the party, huh? It's yeah. coming up? I don't want to go. I'm not going to go. There's no way I'm going to go. No way I'm going to have that happen again. I mean, it's so embarrassing. It's awful. It's, it feels awful. I don't have any friends anyway. What am I going for? I don't like, nobody oh. likes me there. That must be the worst feeling to go to a party and feel like nobody likes you. Oh, I can feel that. Yeah. Do you it. remember um do you remember what we talked about and what we talked about with worry, right? Yeah. And making that character? Yeah. I'm wondering, I know you have that amazing voice for that character. Can you tell me your worried thoughts in that voice? Nobody likes me. Nobody will ever like me. And I hate myself and I can't go. And and it's going to, nobody's going to talk to me and everything's going to be, I can't stand it. I hate it. I hate, this is what I'm into. I'm interested in this video game and that video game. And I don't know, I don't know anything about you and you dress weird and you're not a nice person and there's something wrong with you and you're not good enough and you're not good at sports and you're never going to be my friend and no one's going to be my friend. And that's the way it's going to be forever and ever. Wow. Worry has a lot to say. Worry talks really fast. Okay, let's pick one thing that Worry said that's really worrying you. One one line, say it in the Worry voice. I'm never going to be enough and nobody's going to like me ever. Okay. Now, Eddie, I want you to be yourself. And I want you to talk to Worry because Worry's bullying you right now. Worry's kind of pushing you around. And I want you to talk to Worry and ask him if that stuff is really true, what proof he has. Worry, Worry, you say a lot of harm. You say things that make, that, that are really, really hurtful. You say things that really hurt me. And, and, and you know what? I don't like you. I don't like you. And I don't need to listen to you. And you can say whatever you want to me and I'm going to ignore it. Blah, 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 blah. This is the thing that I make. That's the sound I make when I hear you from now on. You're awesome at that. I wouldn't have done anything close to that, Eddie. Sometimes I talk to my own worry. My worry voice is not as funny as yours, but it comes up for sure. Hmm. Oh my goodness, you're not spending enough time at home. You're not doing enough with the kids. You're not doing enough at work. You're not doing enough. You're not doing enough. You're not doing enough. You're not doing enough. That's what mine sounds like. Kind of sounds like my own voice. <laughs> not as good at that as you are. That's but intense. I talk back to her. Well, what do you say? I'm like, what ever? That is not true. You are doing the best in every single place you can. You can't tell me that. You can't talk to me like that. And you know what? You can chatter all you want, but I'm just kind of ignoring you at this point. We have a winner. That's what I say. So that That's voice say is very worry. strong. Very strong. And that voice is very developed in you. So obviously mm -hmm. you've practiced it a lot. And you, mm -hmm. because it's very strong and it's very clear. So for those of you guys listening, parents listening, this technique is very powerful. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, that won't work for my child at his or her age, just make it relevant to their age. You can pick a character out of maybe their favorite show or if they play video games, their favorite video games. If you make it relevant to the context of their life, they will be able to do it. And even if they don't do it with you in the moment, like Ed and I were just doing, it's a technique that you've planted the seed, right? At least. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you can do it in any way, shape or form. I mean, if you're a parent and you're listening and you experience these things, as we all do, as Rini just did, write it down, notice it, observe it, be aware of it. Oh, I just told myself these things. Worry just told me these things. You know, we can definitely practice this and you can practice it when it's not a crisis. 
practice it. And you can do the role playing just like we're doing the role playing, right? Because Ed and I have to be totally honest with you. We never script the role playing at all whatsoever. And we do that intentionally. So you can see that sometimes it's messy. It's not clean, right? And it doesn't end up tied with a bow at the end. And that's okay. So the goal is not perfection. The goal is progress here. The goal is trying it. It's the it's not the outcome. It's the fact that you're aware, you're questioning it, and there's some awareness. And when you have awareness, you have choice. When you have awareness, you can make a choice about it. When you're not aware of it, and you're just letting the voice go on and on, you start to eat it, you start to consume it, and it starts to take over your your mind and the way you look at the world. And it doesn't have to. It can be stopped like that. Absolutely. And I think what you said, Ed, earlier about the physical symptoms coming up, right? That's a really big thing when we have social anxiety. Our tummies turn over, right? We start getting the racing heart. We sometimes we feel dizzy or faint. Um, our palms are sweating. So all of those things can be scary, right? But knowing if it is truly just anxiety that's causing those physical symptoms, that they're not dangerous is huge because the body feels unsafe, right? You're housed in this thing that is going berserk and it feels unsafe. So for your child or tween or teen to know, listen, there's a false alarm going off in my body. It's making me super uncomfortable, but it's not dangerous. I'm safe. It's uncomfortable, but I'm safe. It's uncomfortable, but it's not dangerous. You can pick a mantra to work out with your child that they can say to themselves over and over again. Because again, I'm just getting this visual out of you with that bow tie on, opening up the doors to the school. And what we want our kids to do in any of those situations in life is to be able to tolerate that distress, feel uncomfortable, but then keep going. And we want you to absolutely wear a bow tie if you have to do that to get yourself. Oh my to do goodness, that. for sure. That is the key, obviously, of the secret sauce. You put you have on to wear a bow tie. You put on your emotional <laughs> bow tie. That's what you do. Uh, I didn't say Botox. I said bow tie. Botox is a different show, and it's on a different network. Um, <laughs> okay, so this this so you've been listening to Dear Anxiety, and and let's just recap. Let's refresh here and say the value of saying something is uncomfortable but not dangerous. And you said a very important word, I think. This is a false alarm. It's alarming. It's false. I may feel it. It's giving me messages that worry, but it's, it's a false alarm. So uncomfortable. Discomfort is okay. It's not permanent. I have strengths. I can accept where I am. I'm uncomfortable right now. I feel uncomfortable. That's where I am at the moment. Okay. Radical acceptance. I accept that I'm uncomfortable right now. And it's not permanent. And being uncomfortable is not dangerous. So those are some right. of the things. And then we talked about externalizing the voice, which is make, make a voice. Have your kid make a voice or draw a picture or write a voice or speak it or interview the worry, make it a character. So that's another thing that you can do if you have small children. If you have teens, that are doing this, you know, there's other kinds of games that you can play. I mean, you certainly can can have them externalize the voice too, or draw a picture or write about it and or journal about it and then discuss it, talk about it. What does it feel like for you? Tell them what it feels like for you as a parent. When I get worried, this is what happens. I remember when I was a kid and I got worried. Those kinds of I remember when I was a kid thing, when you're talking about real emotions and real situations, it's actually not noise to them. It's they'll know that it's the truth, but tell them the truth. Yes, absolutely. And it really just helps you tap back into what they're feeling instantly, right? Yeah, yeah. Even if you're not verbalizing your story, your personal story, even if you think about your story, it really helps with the point of connection for them because that's what you really need. You need them to look you in the eyes and for them to give you that, oh yeah, you get it. You get it. You get what I'm going through, you know, because that is the bond to receptivity. For them to be receptive to whatever you have to say at that point. You're actually so I think we're going to have me. to probably wrap it up soon. We're going right? to wrap up. We have a few things to do, but I think we're going to... Usually we have listener, e listener emails. Oh, yes. Usually Let's we do. do and we have one that we wanted to read this week. Each week we, we try to answer as many as possible, but please write in any concerns. You or your child, write in send a voice message, record something and send it. We'll tell you how to do that in just a minute. But this one I call Unhappy Birthday to You, and it reads from a listener, Hi, Rini and Ed. I have an eight-year-old daughter who is often so fearful and anxious that she isn't able to go to a friend's birthday party. 
And there are times when she doesn't even know why she's so afraid. And then I have my own issues with panic. How do I help her connect the dots between her emotions and physical symptoms? Oh, yeah. So first of all, oh, I feel that because you want your eight-year-old to be able to participate in the birthday party, right? You want her to experience something that may be have been joyful for you, or maybe it was scary for you as well, and you don't want her to go through what you are going through. So you mentioned that you are also panicky. So maybe this is something where you're thinking, oh my goodness, have they learned it from me, right? Am I doing something wrong? Is this learned behavior? So first of all, I want you to, any guilt that you have, mama bear <laughs> that wrote in, please release that right? You're amazing. And for your daughter, she looks at you and she loves you and you are her superhero. Okay. So first step, remember that. And then what can we do here, right? So what we did on the role play today was we talked to our worry. If your daughter is eight, it's a fantastic technique to use with an eight-year-old, right? What is your worry telling you? Especially if your daughter is saying she doesn't know what really worries her. So this is a play therapy technique to externalize the anxiety, right? And it really helps to open up kids because they connect to their imagination. And she probably will st start to tell you what the things are that worry her. But listen, even if she can't get to that point, externalizing it will be helpful, right? Because what she's doing is saying, listen, worry, you're not me. You're not, you're not who I am. I can talk back to you and I'm going to do it so regularly that I'm not going to be afraid of this worry anymore, right? So the first thing is I would suggest to use the technique that we role played today. And then the next thing you do is set up some mini goals, right? If it's really, really frightening for her to be able to go to this birthday party, but you don't want her to miss it, well, don't have her miss it because avoiding it is just going to reinforce the anxiety. So what can we do to just show up? Can we get to the party? Can we stay for 10 minutes? Can we play a game? Can we get to the birthday cake? Can we set up some little goals so that we're able to expose ourselves to the fear? Because the only way to overcome this type of fear, of fear is really what it is, is to be able to try it and, and like jump in there, right, with our feet. We don't have to push our kids into the deep end, but we can gradually expose them to what's making them fearful by creating really mini steps for them and saying you're going to be there for them, but you know that they can go through it and that they'll be able to do it. Great answer. And uh, thank you for writing in. And we're with you and we're with our community and all the people who are listening. Thank you for listening. Thanks for all your great reviews. Please subscribe to the podcast and pass it on so that we can reach more people. You can find the podcast all over the place, wherever podcast, wherever you get your podcast, whether it's Google Play or Stitcher or iTunes. And you can find it at bit.ly, B-I-T-L-Y forward slash Dear Anxiety on iTunes. And please send in emails, share your struggles, share your concerns, whatever even a recorded message from your child or yourself, you send it to gozen, G-O-Z-E-N dot com forward slash Dear Anxiety. Lots of resources available on the Gozen website, G-O-Z-E-N dot com. And just thanks for listening today. Keep coming back. It works if you work it. I'm Ed Krasnick. I'm Rini Jane. See you next time. Thank you, guys. Bye, everybody. <laughs>